hay como una tendencia mecánica muy tonta a confundir la cultura con la producción de libros, que sería mi tarea, yo hago libros, o de obras de teatro, o de cuadros en las galerías, ¿verdad? las exposiciones, bueno, todo eso es cultura también, pero cultura, la cultura es sobre todo el sistema de símbolos que la gente crea para, para comunicarse y para identificarse. Y el fútbol forma parte de ese sistema de símbolos, y de qué manera, hay que ver. A mí siempre me, me llena de estupor cómo cuando se hace una historia del siglo XX no se menciona el fútbol. Las historias del siglo XX rara vez mencionan al fútbol. Y el fútbol es un protagonista fundamental. The elaborate pre-season rituals in Calcutta, India. Football has reached out to diverse societies where few shared cultural references exist. Yet football cultures remain distinct, reflecting the characteristics of individual countries. Once known as the Gold Coast, Ghana is the most successful footballing nation within Africa, a nation where politics have helped mold a distinct football culture It was on these shores that the colonialists first landed, setting up their capital at Cape Coast. Ghana's first club, Excelsior, was born here in 1903. They no longer exist, though the Cape Coast mysterious dwarfs, their modern incarnation, still use the site where Excelsior used to play. Instead, It is the Hearts of Oak who are the oldest surviving club in Ghana, indeed, in the whole of West Africa. The British founded the Gold Coast Football Association in 1922, but tournaments were restricted to Cape Coast, Kumasi, and here in the new capital, Accra, where Hearts dominated the City Championship Cup. Under the patronage of the colonial elite, the locals were often left to run football, Though what the British saw as developments, such as the introduction of boots, didn't always go down too well. When we started playing football, we were not using boots, we were playing barefooted. And uh, when we started using football boots, you know what? We play in the boots, the first half, single half, we, <laughs> we felt uncomfortable, we threw the boots away. <laughs> <laughs> Reminders of British rule remain. But as the first African country south of the Sahara to achieve independence, Ghana was once the center of black African consciousness. Football was very much part of realizing the dreams of a united Africa. As one of Africa's most historic clubs, Hearts of Oak, or the Phobia, as the team are known, played an important role in defining the culture that makes football in Ghana so distinctive. They were the first national champions in 1958, and along with arch rivals Asante Kotoko from Kumasi, became a feared name across the continent. Their training facilities, an uneven patch of dusty communal land they have used for over 40 years may not match those of the European or South American rivals. But in Ghana, club sides have the same dedicated following as elsewhere, despite the huge exodus of players to Europe. In the early 1960s, they were faced with an exodus of an entirely different nature. When President Kwame Nkrumah created his own team, the Real Republicans, he commandeered a number of Hearts players. For Nkrumah, football had become an important political tool. Stanley Matthews, the ageless wizard, takes the field once again. But in case you hadn't noticed, it's not Blackpool he's playing for this time. The scene is Accra Stadium, and his teammates are the Hearts of Oak, Ghana's leading side. 
Over the bar, but never mind. In a few minutes, Stanley's back again, as slippery as ever. A teammate grabs the pass, the goalie runs out, but he dodges him, and the goal's wide open. All the spectators are cheering for Stanley, the uncrowned king of soccer. Uncrowned? The Hearts of Oak soon put that right. The visit of Matthews in 1957 coincided with Ghana's independence celebrations. Led by Nkrumah, Ghana helped stoke the fires of independence across the continent. Who is Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkuma? The, yes. the president. The president. No, no, no. I will take this. Yes. The first president. The first president of Ghana. Clap for him. Nkuma saw football as a political tool to galvanize the whole of Africa. And uh, he thought uh, if he could use football to uh, get the African people together, it could help him spread his uh, policy of uh, United States of Africa. On such a diverse continent, football was a transcending factor. You are watching a scene which may well be historic. The date, December 1958. The place, Accra, Ghana. The occasion, the rallying of people from a whole continent to discuss what may become a new USA, a United States of Africa. Football was a means of expressing unity against the colonial powers and against internal divisions such as tribalism. Nkrumah was leading Africa towards a brave new world, and football was at the heart of his plans. Forward then, to independence. To independence now. Tomorrow, the United States of Africa. Before 1961, the Black Stars, as the Ghanaian national team are known, had been coached by Europeans. As part of his plan to Africanize national life, Nkrumah brought back Charles Giamfi, who was playing in Germany for Fortuna Dusseldorf to become national coach. He and the players all had direct access to the head of state. Being a star within the Black Star, I can always go to him without even making an appointment. I go to him, if I'm in need of anything, I go to him and tell him. The Black Stars became the ambassadors of Ghana, spreading Nkrumah's gospel of Pan-Africanism. I remember in 1965, during the Kenya's Independence Day, we were asked to go to Kenya and exhibit the Ghana brand of football in those days. On Sunday when we met them, we beat them 13 goals to nil. A Kenya national team. And Jomo Kenyatta was there. A very nice independent present for Jomo Kenyatta. At this time, the progress of the Black Stars reflected Ghana's economic and political dominance of the continent. When Ghana hosted the African Cup of Nations in 1963, the Black Stars were a shining example to the rest of Africa. Giamfi, the only black African coach in the competition, Agri Finn, the first of four Black Star captains to lift the nation's cup. Brimming with confidence, the Black Stars traveled to Tunisia to defend their African title two years later, meeting the hosts in the final. Nkrumah had personally promised new houses to the Black Stars if they secured a second African championship, which they did. In 1965, I was a footballer of the year. I was given a television and a, a special song by the police 
was played for me. All the ministers of state were standing up and I was the only person who was sitting there. But I wept, tears of joy. But by this time, Nkrumah's popularity was declining. Nkrumah confronted a lot of problems pursuing that agenda. He was seen as a man who had a, a bloated image of himself, who had a personal agenda to lead Africa and not necessarily to bring the people of Africa together. In 1966, whilst on a trip to China, Nkrumah was overthrown by a military coup. Ghanaian football would never be the same again. Recently we were asked to come for an award. We were given a tea kettle. A tea kettle. In 1965, it had been Nkrumah who had launched the African Champions Cup when his real Republicans attempted to become the first African Cup champions. They failed but the trophy bore his name. 35 years on, Hearts of Oak finally had the chance to add their name to the roll call of winners. Asante Kotoko had last won this competition for Ghana in 1983. An historic day for Hearts of Oak a very rare day of celebration for Ghanaian club football. Finding talented players has never been a problem in Ghana. Qualifying for the World Cup has been, despite two World Championship titles at under-17 level. Ghana's ambition today is not the African Cup because we've had it four times. The people are fed up, but not that is not important. A Nations Cup winner in 1982, Abede Pele never played in a World Cup. What we want now to make an impact in the World Cup, so that is our dream. They are dreams hindered by a lack of investment. A football culture that had early promise in the days of Nkrumah but a culture that struggles to have its voice heard. There are people who still believe, and I'm one of them, that Nkrumah's beliefs is still strong, and some of us, or some of the people, will make it succeed one day or the other. It will take us maybe another 50 years when we are not alive, but it will, it will come on one day, and uh, it will succeed. Across the Atlantic is a football culture where political influences have been minimal, but where money and economics have been critical. A lack of resources is hardly an issue among the growing number of soccer devotees in the United States. Soccer is now the most popular youth sport in a country that has created a unique social phenomena known as soccer mums. These are the mothers of America's suburban youth who dedicate an ever-increasing amount of energy making sure that their children spend leisure time playing soccer. Soccer is part of the fabric of society of the upper uh, third of, of wealth in the country. It's one of the chosen sports. Um, it's kind of seen as a, um, as a thing that you want to see your children doing and that you'll contribute a lot of time and energy and money to see them be successful. People who can't even afford it make sure their kids get on select teams and then find a way to afford it uh, just to keep up with everybody. And that's typical across the country. It is easy to imagine that soccer is new to America, that the youth soccer boom is linked to the incredible successes of the US women's team, or the 1994 World Cup, which America hosted. But soccer in the States goes back a long way. America enjoyed a golden decade after the creation of the American Soccer League in 1921. The Fall River team from a mill town in Massachusetts, here winning the 1924 championship, regularly drew 15,000 supporters. Their best players were American-born. By 1930, there were over 200 registered clubs in the USA. The Great Economic Depression of the 1930s put pay to this golden era of American soccer. During the isolation of the Depression years, 
it was American sports that flourished. Soccer started to be considered un-American, a perception that grew and grew no matter what they tried. There was one congressman, very well-known congressman, who had played professional football, American football, who made a statement once in, uh, in, the, the, uh, in Congress that all this effort to propagate soccer was in fact uh, an, an infiltration of communist thought into the minds of American kids. Though it was an interest in soccer of a well-known politician that allowed the Americans to monitor events in Cuba during the Cold War. The Soviets were building a naval base in a town called Cienfuegos. And the reason we were on to it is because we saw a soccer field there and uh, we know the Cubans don't play soccer and we had never seen a soccer field from the air in Cuba. I was probably more sensitive to the significance of it that this, this didn't mean that the Cubans had suddenly started to learn soccer. It was much more likely that there was a Russian troop unit there. In the 1960s, it was felt that soccer needed to be sold to the American public. Something big needed to be done. The formation of the North American Soccer League, the NASL, in 1968 sold soccer to corporate America. The game became big business overnight, attracting investment from backers like the co-founder of the Super Bowl, Lamar Hunt philosophy behind the North American Soccer League was to build a successful sport financially. Uh, we weren't looking to be charitable. We were trying to uh, uh, build a business that would have lasting quality like uh, American football has and be a successful venture financially. Under the Californian sun, a German center forward kicks off the first professional soccer season in North America. There are no Americans on the field except the referee. A global audience of 400 million television viewers for the 1966 World Cup finals had helped convince corporate America to back professional soccer. And although progress was slow at first, it did catch on. It was a continuing battle to interest an often apathetic public and a hostile media, not just within America. From talking to people out in the sort of wider world, everyone thinks everything we did was, was, was crazy. It wasn't. There was logic behind it. It wasn't American ideas behind it. There were mostly British ideas behind it. And they, were, they had, I said, logic and rationale behind them. <laughs> We did make a few outrageous statements. If we did try some experiments that FIFA didn't like, well, in effect, tough luck, because that's what we had to do to make an impact. It was not just the club game in America which had a long history. In 1924, the American national team took part in the Paris Olympics before touring Poland and the British Isles. Indeed, in 1895, America and Canada had played the first international match outside of Britain. In 1930, the US reached the semi-finals of the first World Cup and then beat England 1-0 in the 1950 finals. Yet still the game struggled. I never played with an American-born player until I joined the national team and uh, met Kyle Rowe Jr. Everybody that I played with growing up until the age of 18, 17, 18 years old was of an ethnic background. Very few Americans play the game of soccer. While soccer remained an amateur, almost underground pursuit for the ethnic minorities, the big time, big money sports of gridiron football and baseball were awash with all American heroes. We were familiar with the, the big names of other sports and we felt that we really had to get big names from soccer. Well, those were 
all overseas people and, uh, and Pelly was the biggest and the best. In 1975, at a price of $7 million, Pelly signed for the New York Cosmos. The NASL started to flourish. Porque nos Estados Unidos eu tinha a oportunidade de estudar, porque eu queria uh, estudar marketing esportivo, eu queria que meus filhos tivessem inglês. E a outra coisa também que era muito importante, que o campeonato americano era cinco, seis meses no máximo. E não tem a pressão que é jogar na Europa e jogar aqui no, no, no Brasil. Even at 34, Pelé was still in a class of his own. No começo eu sofri muito com o Cosmo, porque o Cosmo perdia muito, que era um time de quase garotos de colégio. During halftime of Pelé's first game with the Cosmos, Pelé came into the dressing room and, and asked us not to pass him the ball that often because he was getting exhausted. In 1977, Pelé led Cosmos to the NASL title. I think it was 77, Father's Day 77, when we saw the Cosmos outdraw the Yankees and Mets combined. I think it was playoffs in 1977 when we sold out the stadium on a regular basis, standing room only, 78,000, which had never been done even by the Giants. And then a couple of moments, some, some really major games where we actually played well. Confidence was at an all-time peak. This league will become as big as the NFL is and, uh, and that this country, North America, will become the center of world soccer. Following the success of New York Cosmos, who had attracted Warner Brothers as their backers, the NASL expanded to 24 teams. The problem was the Cosmos were the exception rather than the rule. The six new owners who had been wooed by the sight of a packed Yankee stadium had entered into soccer for a quick dollar. But by the early 1980s, the NASL experiment began to falter. Many of the owners got concerned about the increasing costs and, and one by one they decided that uh, it wasn't going to happen as soon as they liked it to happen. Success wouldn't come early. In 1984, the league folded. The legacy? A whole generation brought up on soccer. You see that today, Os Estados Unidos tem um, um futebol, o nosso soccer, eh, entre os jovens, é um dos maiores esportes nos Estados Unidos. E eu me orgulho muito de ter entende, incentivado isso lá nos Estados Unidos. The inaugural game of Major League Soccer is presented by... On the heels of the huge financial success of the 1994 World Cup, for the third time in American history, a new professional soccer league, Major League Soccer, was launched in 1996. For the shot, gets it far post goal! Goal for Eric Winalda! San Jose has scored! An amazing goal. MLS isn't as successful as the NASL was in its best days. MLS may never be as successful as the NASL was in its best days. Um, you know, among other things, you couldn't possibly sign the players that we signed. They have tremendous advantages, years of soccer being thought of as an American sport now, soccer moms, you know, electing presidents and suburbs full of kids playing soccer and commercials on television using a soccer ball or soccer players as an image depicting typical American life. Now, typical American life is soccer. You know, that's, that's like saying we're all going to start speaking Swahili tomorrow. You know, I mean, it's just unthinkable. The culture of football in the States survived by adapting itself to the American way of life. The passion and support found in the rest of the world just doesn't quite exist in the same way. But it is a culture that refuses to be destroyed. I think if we're conservative uh, and don't lose our minds on thinking that we've got to bring a bunch of foreign players in, I think the sport can grow. I'm seeing definite signs that the American male players are becoming more competitive, more able to hold their own. We're not going to win the World Cup right away, but maybe sometime in the lifetime of my children, 
of the United States will be able to compete at that high level. On the other side of the world, in Iran, football has also had to fight a battle for recognition. This time in a society dominated by fundamentalist religious doctrines. Following the Islamic Revolution of 1979, football struggled for acceptance in a culture that was initially hostile. Nineteen years on from the revolution, Football reached the high table of cultural life in this Islamic state with the national team's qualification for France 98. For the first time since the revolution, religious leaders admitted that they lost control of the streets as men and women celebrated. The United Kingdom had enjoyed healthy political and economic relations with Persia at the turn of the 20th century. And with a consulate in 22 Iranian cities, football was a familiar sight around the country. When football was in the country, the people of Tehran were not in the country. They 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 were not it was a game, however, that slowly gripped the imagination of one of the oldest civilizations in the world. The ancient capital of Persopolis lending its name to a team that was to become the most popular in the country. Royal patronage was forthcoming, and in 1925, the Tehran club played and beat a British colonial team with the Reza Shah in attendance. He didn't believe that defeat could be in the blood of Iranians. The real revolution of Iranian football took place when the Reza Shah's son took over in 1941. Under the European educated king, the modernization of Iran became a major priority. He saw football as the most popular medium of this westernization. Before taking over the crown, the young prince even had his own team. The football stars of the day would have to come to the palace to play. خودش فوتبال بازی میکرد و فوتبالیستای خیلی قدیمی ما تعریف میکردن برامون که ما هفته یه بار با تیم دربار مسابقه میدادیم. البته زیاد حق دریب یا نزدیک شدن به شاه یا تکل زدن یا حتی گاهی پیروز شدن بر تیم اونا رو نداشت. By the late 1960s, Iran had become unbeatable in Asia. In 1968, they beat Israel in the final of the Asian Cup in Tehran. That they were even playing Israel speaks volumes for the political climate in Iran at the time. Fated by the Shah during his birthday celebrations that year, the national team went on to defend their title in 1972 and 1976 winning every match they played in the competition over a period of eight years. In 1978, Iran capped their dominance in Asia when they qualified for the World Cup finals, but they found it tough going in Argentina. Against Holland, they gave away two penalties, numerous free kicks, and lost 3-0. اون هم چین برخوردایی که در ایران میشد مثلا پنالتی نمی گرفتن یعنی این پنالتی هایی که اونجا گرفتن تازه ما فهمیدیم که چی تو وای پنالتی میگیرن که در ایران شاید شدیدتر از اون نمی گرفتن فقط این بود نه به خاطر ضعف دفاع و ضعف بازیکنای دیگر گلر اینا نبود فقط به خاطر اون آمودش صحیح رو که داوره ما نداشتن به بازیکن انتقال بدن فقط به خاطر همین مسئله بود ما گلای زیاد رو از نقطه پنالتی the highlight of Iran's first World Cup outing was a creditable one-all draw with Scotland. But at the peak of Iran's domination of Asian football, sport was washed aside by the arrival of the Islamic Revolution. The Ayatollah Khomeini, who had spent 15 years in exile, returned home whilst the Shah fled. His pursuit of Western ideals disappeared into exile with him. It was back to fundamental Islamic principles, and football found itself in a precarious position. In 
انقلاب فوتبال رو به عنوان یکی از مظاهر منفی رژیم شاه زیر سوال برد همه به محض وقوع انقلاب همه شمشیرها رو علیه فوتبال از رو بستن همه فکر میکردن که شاید این فوتباله که شاه با تکی کردن بر اون باعث شده که مردم از سرنوشت اساسی خودشون دور باشن خیلی زود همون نگرش منفی که میگفتم فوتبال افیون جامعه است دوباره توی خیلی از سخنران ها نموت پیدا کرد در سخن هاشون In the new Islamic Republic of Iran, everything was reordered and renamed. The league was suspended and the two most popular clubs in Iran were shut down. There was even talk of stopping football altogether. Football shorts were considered indecent, and alternatives were discussed. An age limit of 27 was placed on national team players to discourage the excessive worship of anything other than Islam. And then there was the devastating war with Iraq that lasted eight years, during which well over half a million young Iranians perished. چون در هر صورت جنگ من فکر کنم در اولویت قرار داره تا اینکه ورزش ما باید بالاخره از خاک خودمون دفاع می کردیم که نذاریم یه دشمن وارد خاک بشه مجبور بودیم که بجنگیم حالا ورزش هم نباشه هیچ مسئله نیستش چون اولویت با اون بود 7 years after the Iran Iraq war had ended came the first signs that football had survived as a force in Iran when the two countries met on each other's soil for the first time in the Asian Club Championship Iraq won this encounter, but Iran had re-entered the sporting mainstream. The real grudge match, though, was still to come. Having qualified for France 98, Iran was drawn to play their greatest contemporary enemy, the great Satan, America. The whole world watched on in fascination. The World Cup is beloved across our planet because it offers a chance for people from around the world to be judged not by the place they grew up, the color of their skin, or the way they choose to worship, but by their spirit, skill, and strength. As we cheer today's game between American and Iranian athletes, I hope it can be another step toward ending the estrangement between our nations. The 2-1 win by the Iranians removed any doubt amongst the clergy in Iran that football was an anti-Islamic force to be feared. Although the players made little of the symbolism of the victory, back in Tehran, state television broadcast this announcement. Tonight's honorable and brave game was a beautiful picture of the struggles and conflicts between the Iranian nation and the great Satan. Tonight, the strong and arrogant opponent felt the bitter taste of defeat at your hands. Football football is not a Football سرگرمی ساز دنیا دیگه حتی مقامات جمهوری اسلامی هم راضی کرده که نگاه ویژه ای به این ورزش داشته باشن ورزشی که بر در نظر اینا هم دیگه باعث اتحاد و همدلی نه افیون جامعه فوتبال در ایران is perhaps one of the most vivid examples of the universality of football here was a force that had to fight for acceptance in a host culture when that battle was won It provided Iran with one of its few connections with the non-Islamic world, 
and it became a potent unifying symbol in the country. In Spain, another country where religion offers a common bond, football has had the reverse effect as in Iran. The historic struggle for autonomy among several of the 17 regions has often left the country divided, especially on the football field. España es un es un país complejo eh, formado por la suma de muchas comunidades que tienen eh, eh, personalidades, estilos de vida eh, distintos. Eso también ocurre en, en el fútbol. España no tiene un, un estilo propio. Ese es el primer problema. El segundo problema es que como cada ciudad y cada región tiene sus equipos representativos, los niños eh, sueñan más con ponerse la camiseta de su ciudad, la camiseta de su equipo, que la camiseta de la selección, que no acaba de, de encontrar su manera de ser. ¿no? Of all of Spain's regions, the Basque country is best known for its bloody and violent campaign for independence. During the Spanish Civil War in 1937, Guernica, the seat of the Basque government as far back as the 12th century, was destroyed by the bombs of General Franco, an act of violence which marked the beginning of 30 years of suppression of Basque culture. Athletic Bilbao, from the Basque country's industrial capital, was the earliest force in Spanish football. Since the club's formation in 1898, Athletic have never been relegated and have won a record number of Spanish Cups and eight championships, including the double, here in 1984. All these titles have been won with players born exclusively in the Basque region. Eta kontu honeoki behar da, e, lehenik e, atletikek e, bere jokalariarekin e, ba, oso talde onak egin zituela eta e, txapelketa asko erabizituztela. Eta horrek non baite, tradizio bihurtu du orain dagoen e, egoera hau, ez da? Under Franco, the Basque culture, including the language, which to this day baffles linguists as to its origin, was outlawed. A Basque national team in exile toured the world publicizing their struggle. Me jokatzen da Euskal Selezioak eh, gabonetan, zuk izan duzun moduan, jokatzen du partido bat eh, urtero. Ia bada amar bat urte edo, hasi dela jokatzen, ez da? Eta oso ambiente polita egoten da, eta, eh, eta bai, ni guzti dut, nahia bada hola, hemen eh, Selezioak eh, eh, ofizialtasun bat eh, lortzea, Europan eta abar jokatzeko, eh, nahi hori badago. From its beginnings, Spanish football reflected the regional nature of the country. When Athletic played Barcelona in the 1912 Spanish Cup, the tournament was no more than an end-of-season competition for the various regional league winners. It was Barcelona, the team of Catalonia's capital, who won the first national championship in 1929. Just as in the Basque country, Football became the only medium of protest under the cultural suppression that Catalonia suffered under Franco. The club's motto, more than a club, is intended to reflect Barcelona's symbolic importance to the region of Catalonia. Lligat a la història de Catalunya, Catalunya pràcticament moltes ocasions ha volgut ser quasi, quasi independent i llavors automàticament doncs, quasi, quasi molts dels catalans Catalunya la veuen com un país no? i automàticament a l'època del franquisme doncs, semblava que eren els catalans contra la resta d'Espanya no? i que l'equip del Barça sempre era una manera d'expressar una miqueta el sentiment aquest de Barça. No? Under Franco, Catalunya's unique personality emerged more strongly than ever through art, architecture, and of course, football. 
As a region, Catalonia has tended to look abroad rather than to Spain for inspiration. So despite this close association with the region, Barcelona has always enjoyed the best of foreign talent. The Hungarian, Kubala, led the club to a treble of League, Cup and Latin Cup in 1952, even forcing an uncomfortable official acknowledgement of their success from General Franco. A la meva època, moltes vegades, quan hi havia gent doncs, convocada, doncs, fins i tot deien, bueno, no hi vagis, o si sigui, em convocaven a quatre o cinc, n'hi anàvem dos, i els altres tres no hi anaven, no? Vull dir, no hi ha hagut mai aquest esperit de selecció que hi ha hagut en altres països. En 1992, Barcelona won the European Cup, a tournament dominated in the early years by arch-rivals Real Madrid. Johan Cruyff's side were dubbed the Dream Team, after the American basketballers at that year's Barcelona Olympics. This is the most brilliant, because for us, Wembley is something very mythical, and the colophon of these stories, seeing Alessandro taking the Cup of Europe, is the great thing that was missing from this enormous pastel. In the Second World War, Spain had remained neutral, though they often played matches against Italy, Germany, and here against occupied France. Seen to have sided with Hitler and Mussolini, Spain was excluded from the Marshall Plan. In post-war Europe, Spain found itself isolated politically and economically. One man's ambition, based in Madrid, the heartland of Franco's centralist regime, would propel the Republic to the forefront of European attention. The Santiago Bernabéu was when they started to three great players, like Di Stefano, like Copa, like Puskas, Santa Maria, like Real, and then they started to surge with Real Madrid with those great players. Normally, in Madrid, they always based on Spanish players, Y entonces lo, lo de Di Stefano ya pues fue un exitazo. Di Stefano signed for Real in 1953 after a fight for his signature involving River Plate in Argentina, Milanarias of Colombia, and Barcelona. Yo no jugué ningún partido, ni firmé ningún contrato. Era un problema de directiva de ellos. Y entonces se produce esto y me tengo que ir a, a Madrid. Y con, 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 con mucho gusto, porque yo lo que quería era jugar en el fútbol. A mí me daba lo mismo jugar, haber jugado en el Madrid que en el, jugar en el Barcelona. Pero en ese momento te dicen eh, blanco o negro. Y yo no puedo elegir. Entonces me tocó blanco. Di Stefano's first game for Real Madrid was against Barcelona. The Spanish Federation had decided that he should play a season at a time for each of the two clubs. But Barcelona decided against taking up this option, a decision they were to regret. This match was one of the single defining moments in the history of Spanish football. Played in the symbolic core of Franco's dictatorship, Di Stefano scored a hat-trick as Real won 5-0. To this day, Real v Barça is the grudge game in Spain, if not the world. Di Stefano's arrival certainly gave Real Madrid the upper hand in the opening rounds. De la época nuestra nos adelantamos 20 años antes, antes a jugar el fútbol de contraataque, no justo con los cinco delanteros que jugaban y eso nosotros siempre jugábamos y arrancábamos del centro campo porque había en el equipo velocidad. In the 15 years after Di Stefano joined, Real won 11 league titles and six European Cups. In 1957, they played Italian champions Fiorentina in the European Cup final in Madrid, the second of five straight wins in the competition. Spain was still in the diplomatic wilderness and Franco associated himself with the club as much as possible. Franco le gustaba más cazar, 
El fútbol no le gusta. Éramos los embajadores de España, porque claro, eh, nosotros éramos un partido de dictador y, y entonces en Europa pues no caíamos muy bien, aunque el equipo caía muy bien, ¿no? Porque a, realizaba un gran juego. Nosotros éramos los embajadores porque éramos los únicos que salíamos a Europa. When Franco allowed a US military base on Spanish soil in 1962, he used Real to do the public relations job. As Franco sought to end Spain's isolation, Real Madrid played a useful role for him. For the rest of Spanish football, Real were regarded as the team of the regime. El vínculo era que lo de Franco, que no tenemos nada que decir nosotros y meternos en política, y no me meteré nunca, es que se aprovechaban de la fama nuestra para hacerse más grande, no nosotros del, del, del gobierno. Entonces la gente, el público, de provincia, lo que sea, dice, así, así gana el Madrid. No, el Madrid gana con clase. By the late 1950s, the Spanish national team had an abundance of quality players. However, in 1958, they failed to qualify for the World Cup finals, and in 1960, they faced political problems in the first European Championship. Nosotros teníamos un equipo muy grande porque jugaba Di Stefano, que estaba naturalizado, jugaba Kubala, jugaba yo. Era un grande, una gran selección y ganábamos, íbamos por todos los lados y ganábamos por cuatro o cinco goles fuera de casa y tal. Y llegó a, no sé si eran cuartos o semifinal, que nos tocó con Rusia. Pero España, ese año, eh, Franco, no tenía relaciones diplomáticas con Rusia. Por culpa de la política de no haber esta cosa, nosotros nos quedamos sin poder jugar cuando teníamos grandes posibilidades de ganar este, este trofeo. Para nosotros fue una gran, una gran decepción. En 1964, the Spanish hosted the European Championship. Ironically, holders Russia reached the final where they met Spain. This time, the match went ahead. En ese partido fue el único partido al que vino, asistió Franco en ese partido y era una cosa para él importante que ganara España. O sea, para la situación política en España fue importante, porque era mejor, fue una cosa buena. Hablo solo de política. Después para el jugador, para nosotros fue muy importante también, porque era el primer título que conseguía España a nivel internacional. Pero... Eh, no, yo no pensaba, y creo que como mis compañeros no pensaban que iba a ser tan importante después, por desgracia para el fútbol español, que, fue, que se volviera tan importante de, de cara al futuro. ¿Por qué? Pues porque España no ha vuelto a ganar nada más. Es el único título que tiene. Franco died in 1975 and is buried here in the Valley of the Fallen just outside Madrid. His legacy is a country where diversity of regional cultures has been strengthened, not suppressed. The question is, does this have anything to do with the lack of success experienced by the national team? Regionalismo, no, todo eso. Eso es todo, eso es todo hablar por hablar y, y gente que no sabe realmente nada. O sea, otra cosa es que venga al contrario, que demuestre que es mejor que tú, como demostró Italia en aquellos momentos, o Alemania, y, y que demuestre que es mejor que tú, o sea, pero no es porque seas más regionalista o menos se gana o se pierde en los partidos, no, ni mucho menos. Many in Barcelona would disagree. They see their club's European Cup victory in 1992 not as a victory for Spain, but for their region, Catalonia. Aquí a España no ha tingut mai eh, esprit de, de nació, per dir-ho de manera, no? A todos los países, primero está el país y después están los clubes. O sea, Brasil, el máximo de... era jugar en Brasil. A partir de aquí, después cada club. A Francia, el mateix, a Italia, el mateix. Aquí, de a... a problemas históricos, no ha sido muy así. No? Seen here representing the Basque national team, 
Goalkeeper Zubi Zareta is ironically Spain's most capped player ever. Es una pena porque España tiene que ganar jugando bien al fútbol y haciendo. Si nosotros ganásemos como como a veces ha llegado no sé, Italia o Alemania a finales, y estoy seguro que se genera una gran polémica también en este país, ¿no? Sobre si merece la pena llegar a una final jugando tan mal al fútbol o no. ¿no? Bueno, somos un país al final que discute sobre sobre todo, ¿no? Y el fútbol es un tema muy muy bueno para discutir, ¿no? Among all the different football cultures, there is one common factor. For the majority, the game is not just about superstars playing in World Cup finals. For millions of people from all kinds of cultures and backgrounds, football is just fun. After all, that is how it started. <laughs> 